All right. So talking about probability, again, this is our transition between or from descriptive statistics into inferential. So we're talking about probabilities. This is chapter four. Like I said, it is the basis for making decisions about our data. That's really what we're going to be doing. And it's based on this idea. If something has a low probability, that means its occurrence is going to be rare. So if something has a low chance of happening, you say it's probably not going to happen. That, that's really the whole idea here. I mean, it might be an obvious statement, but what we're going to think of it is low probability means rare or unusual occurrences. Occurrences, two hours, one hour. I never know. I think it's two. Like that. One. Is this occurrences? Okay, one hour. You were right. Whatever. And there's some vocabulary that we do need to talk about. Speaking of vocabulary, there's some vocabulary that we need to talk about as well before we get going on exactly what probability is going to be in relation to this class. The first word we need to talk about is a word called an event. Event in statistics doesn't mean event like in, in English. Uh, in English, an event means you're having like a party or something, that's our event. Here, that's not what it means. Uh, what event means for us is a collection of outcomes of a procedure. So an event is what you get from a procedure. Now I'll explain this and give you examples in just a minute. So event, it's a collection of outcomes of a procedure, so something you're doing. We also have another couple words. We have something called a simple event. <laughs> a simple event is a single outcome, one specific single outcome. Don't worry, I'm going to flesh all of this out with an example in about two or three minutes. Last word, we have something called a sample space. The sample space is everything that could possibly happen, all the simple events. So all simple events, in other words, every possible outcome. So an event. Event is something that can happen when you do a procedure. A procedure such as rolling a die, flipping a coin, something that involves some chance in there. A simple event is one specific outcome that, that you can get. Uh, the sample space is everything that you could possibly get from flipping the coin or rolling the die. So let me give you an example. We'll talk about flipping a coin, and we'll, we'll identify some events and some simple events, and then the sample space. Would you like to do that and kind of get an idea about what this stuff actually means? So let's go ahead, and our example would be flipping a coin. So our procedure.
We're going to flip a coin one time. So you're going to take a coin out of your pocket, you're going to flip it, and you're done. You understand the procedure, right? Flip a coin. Cool. Here's an example of an event. An event could be, what can you get out of the coin? Can you get edge? No, you can get usually edge. Wouldn't it be cool if you just flipped it and landed on the edge? Has it ever happened to you before? Has it ever happened? I th what if it's happened to somebody before? Well, maybe if you had like a edge of a coin that's like that wide, it could probably happen. But like with a quarter or something, I, it's really rare that that's ever going to happen. I, I don't know that it ever has. Anyway, that's just, I got that forever possibility, I guess, but uh, if you're flipping a coin, there's only two things that can happen, right? You can get heads or tails. When you're talking about an event, you're specifying one thing that could happen and what you're looking for. So an example of an event in this case would be you're looking to, for how many heads you get. So an event, an example of an event would be head. Flipping a head. Which, coincidentally, that's also a simple event, one thing that could happen. Our sample space includes every possible outcome you can get when you do your procedure. Now, our procedure is flipping a coin how many times? One time. Just once. So you flip the coin. What could you possibly get from flipping the coin one time? Okay, so that's what our simple our sample space is. Is you either get a head or you get a tail. Can you get anything else besides a head or a tail when you flip the coin one time? No, we're not going to get to the edge thing. That's really not realistic. And we put these funny little brackets around there. If you're trying for the first time, it might end up like that. That's okay. It's a kind of a nice curvy bracket though. Takes you a lot of years to master that. Master's level stuff, you know, try brackets, whatever. So our sample space is a collection of simple events. So here's what we're talking about. Procedure is what you're, you're doing. Event is what you're looking for. Simple events are what could happen. And your sample space is a collection of all those things. Do you kind of understand more the idea of events, simple events, and sample spaces? The next example will really make it even more clear for you. So the procedure is what you're doing. The event is one outcome that you're looking for. So we're looking to get for a head here. Or you could have had tails there. What you can get uh, flip by flip, those are called your simple events. One, out, one specific outcome. So here we can only get a head or a tail. If you combine all of those simple events together, you get what's called your sample space. I'm not sure if you're still with me on this. Let's do one more example to really illustrate this. The procedure now is we're going to take that coin back in our pocket and we're going to flip it three times. So we're going to flip, what would that be, thrice? We'll flip thrice, three times. If you flip a coin three times, what could you get? Well, you get heads or tails for the first one, right? But then you flip it again. What could you get out of that one? Okay, then you flip it again. What should you get out of that one? So, an event is like this. An event says, what, what possible combinations could you have? Those would be considered our events. So, one event would be, I'm looking for one head and two tails. That's an example of an event, one specific outcome of your, your procedure. Does that make sense to you? So this says, OK, one thing that could happen here is I get a head and two tails. Now, we're going to find out each of the simple events. So what are the simple events that could happen? What could you get when you flip your coin three times? You could get three heads. That's a good place to start. So you get all three heads. Head, head, head. 
What else could you get? What now? You get tails three times. Okay, that maybe put that down here. That could happen, right? These right now, what we're finding, these are simple events. They're single outcomes that we can get from flipping a coin three times. Can we get just a single head? Not if you, well, I'm sorry. Can you get just a single head and no tails? Not if you're flipping it three times, right? You're going to get three distinct things that happen. A head, a head, and a head. A tail, a tail, a tail. What else could I get? Okay. So I heard two heads, what do you mean two heads and one tail? <laughs> Sounds a little weird. Uh, I mean, in order. Like, you can get two heads and a tail several different ways. One way could be if you go head, head, tail, right? Give me another way. Head, tail, head. Head, tail, head. That's another good one. Okay. What about another one? Anything else that we could do? Starting with heads. Well, you know what that was, you starting with heads. Anything we could do, I'm going to erase that for a second. Starting with heads. We had head, 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 tail, head, tail, head, head. Tail, 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 okay. So these are all, this, all simple events starting with heads. We could do head, 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 tail, head, tail, head, head, tail, tail. Let's do the tail ones. We could have tail, tail, tail. Give me some other things that we could have here. Tail, tail, what else? You could have tail, head, head. You could have tail, tail, head. Tail, head, tail. And we already have the tail, tail, tail. Would you look that over? Did I miss any? Did I miss any possible outcomes we could get? Are you seeing how we're getting these things? We're just imagining flipping a coin, right? Imagine flipping a coin three times, you can get a head, a head, and a head. You get a head, a head, and a tail. It's easiest to do it that way, well, for me, to, to sit there and think of all the heads and then think of all the ways you can have a head first. It'd be head, head, head. Great. Head, head, and then a tail. Or head, and then a tail, and the head. Or a head, and then two tails. And that takes care of everything that starts with H. Then you go tail, tail, tail. Okay. Tail, tail with an H. Then tail, then a head, then a tail. Then tail, head, head. That way you know you have all of them up there. Are you with me? Okay. So what we've just done, we've listed out all the possible single outcomes up here. Are you with me on that? All the possible single outcomes. Those are all the simple events. Simple events mean a single outcome. So what we've done here, that's a simple event. That's a simple event. And so are the rest of these. All eight of these things are called simple events. If I group them all together like I've done, what we have is called the sample space. The sample space is a collection of everything that could possibly happen. Raise your hand if you're with me on that. Okay. Now, let me, because the biggest thing for people is like, well, what's the difference between a simple event and an event? Is an event the same thing? The answer is no. An event is... It doesn't matter how you get it, that's what I'm looking for. So for instance, our procedure's flipping a head, or flipping a coin three times. Our event we're looking for is getting one head and two tails. That's one of the things that we could get flipping a coin three times, right? That's just one of the things we could get. Here is all of our possible simple events or our sample space or each individual outcome. Those things are kind of synonymous. The collection of simple events is the sample space. How many ways can this happen? Is there more than one way you can get one head and two tails? How many ways? Six. Six ways? One head, two tails? Does this have one head and two tails? Does this have one head and two tails? How about this one? One head, two tails. How about this one? That's one of them. Put a little star there. This one? This one? One head, two tails. This one? This one? No, it has two heads and one tail. So here's the difference between an event and a simple event. 
An event says, overall, what are you looking to have happen? But you're looking for a head and two tails. Simple events are the way that you can accomplish that event. Are you seeing the difference? The event is what you're looking for. Simple events are ways you could accomplish that or not accomplish that. They're all the specific outcomes. So how many ways can we accomplish our event? There's three ways. Three simple events will accomplish our main event. Does that make sense to you? So I, it's a little little tricked up. Do you guys have any questions? Oh, well, it's a little tricky sometimes if you really don't get the, the whole concept. So are there any questions on what we, we just talked about? Procedure, that's kind of basic. That's just what you're doing. Events are what you're looking for. Simple events are how you accomplish your events. They're individual outcomes. Some of them are going to accomplish your events. Some of them, obviously, are not going to accomplish your events. Let's try one more. I want you to do it. Um, Give me another event that I could have with flipping a coin three times. What's another event? What could happen? Can anything else happen besides one head and two tails? Okay, give me one. What now? One tail to One tail to that works. One tail, two heads. Okay. Is there any other events that I could have? What's that? Three heads. How many tails? Well, none, because they're all three heads. And the last one we could have is what? Two tails. So these are all examples of events. We have here's an event, here's another event. These are the last two events. There's really nothing else that could happen, right? Notice how many individual outcomes we have. So there's more individual outcomes than we have total events because some of these overlap. This right here that I started, that's three ways to accomplish this one event. How many ways can you accomplish this event? Can you see it? How many ways? Where are we finding that out? Look over there. How many, how many times do you get one tail and two heads? Here's one tail and two heads. That's one. Here's one head, tail and two heads. There's another one. That's one, two, three squiggly things. Looks kind of like these. So the three squiggly things that accomplishes this event, three single outcomes, three simple events, would accomplish this event. True? Okay. How many ways can you accomplish this event? There's only one. Boxy thing. Boxy thing does this one, and circle thing. Does that one? <laughs> I'm joking around, but I mean, this, this is the relationship between simple events and events. Events are the overall thing you're looking for, okay? That's it. Simple events are the individual outcomes that you could get from your procedure. Some of those simple events are going to satisfy your event. Maybe only one. Maybe up to three. Maybe more than that. If we were flipping a coin four times, you could have lots of outcomes that, that satisfy your event. Do you understand the relationship between procedures, events, and simple events, and the sample space? The sample space is not a problem. You just collect all the individual simple outcomes, and that's it. Or simple events, and that's it. So, now that we understand that, we can really use those words to kind of describe some probability. So let's do that right now. When we say probability in this class, say probability, we're talking about the likelihood of an event occurring. The likelihood of an event occurring. Notice I'm not saying the likelihood of a simple event, although sometimes those might be one and the same. If there's only one possible outcome that satisfies your event, then the probability is one and the same. But when we talk about probability, we're saying the probability that your event happens. Or the likelihood. The likelihood of an event occurring.
We're going to use, what letter do you think we would use for probability? Geniuses, every one of you. What if it was like R? Wouldn't you be confused? Yeah, no, P, you're exactly right. So probability is P. Events are usually listed with capital letters. So if we're talking about event A, we're just going to say A. So A could be uh, flipping a coin three times. Event whatever you're talking about. So we, we can list it. You can even list it in words. You don't have to use the letters. But if we're talking about an event, so for instance, event A, or you could write flipping a coin three times, or anything like this, B, C, etc. If we're talking about the probability of an event occurring, the way we write that is we say probability of A. That doesn't mean multiplication. It's not like algebra. It says probability of A. It's more like a function notation if you want to consider it as something. You're finding the probability of this event happening, basically. And so this means the probability of event A actually occurring. We actually have three types of probability we deal with. And you deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, really, you do when you think about it. Um, you'll, you'll probably notice this when I'm going through it. But there are three types of probability. The first type of probability is what you get when you actually perform an experiment. Um, it's called observed probability. So observed probability happens when like, you took your coin and you flipped it 100 times and you calculated how many heads you got, you calculated how many tails you got, and from there you can actually mathematically figure out what's the probability of getting a head. Because maybe your coin's weighing a little funny. Do you see the, the picture in there? That's observed probability, when you actually do something and you get a probability from that observation. You follow? So observed probability, it's probability that is estimated based on your observation. that is estimated, estimated, wait a second, why estimated, why isn't it exact? Well, can you ever do a procedure for so long that, you, that you've accomplished all, let's see, let me, let me rephrase it a different way, that doesn't, make, doesn't flow right. Can you ever perform a procedure so many times that you've exhausted all the possible times you could do it? For instance, could you flip a coin until you can stop flipping a coin anymore? Can you do that forever? So can you calculate the probability if you can't do it forever exactly? And the answer is no. You can't flip a coin enough for you to have an exact probability. All you can do is say, maybe I flip it 100,000 times. Is that enough to get the probability of flipping a coin? The answer is pretty close, but no, not exactly. I mean, you're not going to get the exact probability of flipping a coin by doing observations. One, the, that's why it's called observed, and it's estimated. You observe it for a certain number that you decide on. Say, I want to flip the coin 100 times, and after that, I'm going to calculate the probability it's going to be estimated. It's not going to be exact because I can't flip that coin forever. I don't want to. I should flip it a certain number of times to make sure that I have at least a good sample of uh, outcomes there. Does that make sense to you? So we can't do it forever, and that's why it's estimated. And fortunately, it's not too hard to figure out. If we want to find the probability of A here, all 
we do is we take the number of times A occurred divided by the number of times you perform that procedure. So number of times A occurred, remember A is your event, number of times A occurred, you just divide it by the number of times your procedure was repeated, so the number of times you did that thing. I'm going to give you all three of these, and then we're going to I'll give you some examples so we can calculate these things uh, independently and figure out what they are. So first one, observe, it's you're actually doing something. You're actually going out there and flipping the coin, or going out there and taking a poll, or going out there and observing what someone's doing, and that's you're basing your probability off of that. Okay, a perfect example for this, if you really want one right now, so you're not really quite clear, is, um, you, do you watch baseball? Do you know what baseball is? <laughs> okay, good. So, you know these guys up there with the sticks, they swing, right? And they, they hit this little white thing coming to the uh, And sometimes it hits them and they get mad. They go out and tussle. <laughs> tussle. I haven't heard that word in a while, but they tussle a little bit. So. Baseball is all about statistics, right? I mean, you hear statistics on baseball players all the time. If you're into sports or you watch Sports Center for like five minutes, they're always talking about baseball. I, I personally, I don't like baseball. Um, but if you play it, whatever, that's cool. Uh, so, but they're always talking about the statistics. And so, if someone has a batting average of um, 100, would you expect them to go up there and hit the ball? Do you think? A batting average of 100 means. Um, one out of every ten, 10 times they're going to hit the ball. Is that good? Is that bad? A batting average of 400 is excellent. Okay? A batting average of 100 really sucks. It's horrible. They're not going to hit the ball. But that, that right there, with their getting that batting average of 400 or 450 or 333, any of those, those decimals that you see on the back of the baseball court, if they're talking about that, that is an observed thing, right? What they did is they said, oh, how many times have you hit the ball? Eight times. How many times were you up to bat? 24. That means that 8 times out of 24 times you hit the ball, that's 33%, or 0 0.33333. That's how they're calculating that. That would be an observed probability, because later on they're going to say, oh, you usually hit the ball 8 times out of every 24 times, right? Are you automatically going to become a, a huge success and hit it every single time? Maybe, but probably not. Probably you're going to stick with those odds. That's observed probability and how you use it. Does that make sense to you? So it's what someone's actually done, and then you take that, and you estimate it, and you apply it towards, towards their future. Say if you hit the ball eight times out of every 24 times, chances are you're going to probably con continue that statistic. So when you come up to that next, you get a one-third chance of hitting the ball. That's how you use observed probability. Let it help you out with that. Okay, all right. So observed is something that actually happened. You measured it. Uh, the next one is classical probability. The next one is what I say to you, and you answer me this question. I say, uh, what's the probability of flipping a coin and getting ahead? Okay, you have to answer to play along here. What's the, what's the probability of you flipping a coin and getting ahead? Obviously, right? There's two choices. One of those choices is ahead, so you get 50%, right? What's the probability of rolling a die one time and getting a two? Why one out of six? And how many choices are twos? That's how you're getting one out of six, right? That is classical probability. Are you actually rolling the die to figure that out in your head? You're just thinking about it, right? You're thinking, oh, obviously there's six sides, only one of them's a two, so have a one in six chance. You're doing classical probability there. Notice the difference between observed, where they actually calculated how many times you hit the ball divided by how many times it was up, to classical. Classical is a theory. Um, observed probability is the actuality. 
the classical is what should happen, observed is what did happen. Do you see the difference there? Classical is what should happen when you flip a coin. You should get half heads, half tails. If you flip a coin ten times, are you going to for sure get five heads and five tails? If you think so, I'll make you a bet right now and I'll make a lot of money with you that I can flip the coin. Rarely is it going to be exactly five heads. Rarely. You're, you're rarely going to get that. I mean, well, not rarely, maybe 30% of the time. I'll make a lot of money from you if we make that bet every single time over and over again. So you're not going to get exactly five heads every single time. It's not going to happen. Sometimes you'll get six heads out of ten. Sometimes you get nine. Sometimes you get all ten. Sometimes you get one. But that's... Here, no, that, sorry. That's the, uh, that's the classical probability as opposed to the observed. Classical is what should happen every time. Observed is if you actually do the experiment, what does happen every time. So let's talk about classical. We pretty much just discussed it. This is the probability based on the chance of something occurring. This is, uh, this is the theory like the theory aspect of probability. By the way, for classical probability to work, um, each event has to have an equal chance of occurring. Each simple event has to have an equal chance of occurring. example about this, okay? Let's say that you had, because uh, this statement, people are like, well, why Why does it have to have an equal chance of occurring? Think about this. Let me give you a die, and I'll tell you it's a weighted die, okay? It's a weighted die. What's the problem? Do you know what a weighted die is? They put a die in a corner so it comes up certain numbers differently. Um, used in Vegas sometime, or they used to, to get sevens all the time. I would never do anything like that. <laughs> but, anyway. Um, the simple event must have an equal chance of occurring means that if I give you a weighted die and I say, what's the probability of rolling a two, you can't say one-sixth anymore because, well, you don't know. You don't know what the weight is. So in order for you to do the theory approach, the, the, uh, something that has a chance of occurring, you have to have an equal chance there, right? The only way you were able to figure out one-sixth earlier um, when I said, what's the probability of rolling a two is because you thought that every side has an equal chance of happening, right? That's why you did that. That's why when you said, well, it gets a it head 50% of the time when you flip a coin once, because you figure heads and tails has an equal shot, don't you? That's what classical is based on. It's based on every simple event has an equal chance of occurring. Now, the way that we did this, you've already done it. I mean, you know classical probability intuitively. That's what we talk about most of the time. Looks really similar. It's just that instead of number of times A occurred, we say the number of times A could occur. Or number of ways, I guess. Divided by the total number of possible outcomes again. number of simple events, and we just mean outcomes there. Because we've kind of covered that at length right now. I need to recap just a little bit before we go any further. So you really need to understand the difference between observed probability and classical. I'm going to ask you on your test. I'm going to give you a problem and say, what is this? 
calculate probability, tell me if it's observed or classical. That's going to be like three or four problems on your test. Uh, so you need to be able to identify, are you doing something or are you just thinking about it? That's the difference. If you're observing something or someone has observed something, that's observed probability. If you're just thinking about uh, how many times could you get a two if I'm willing to die, if it's something like that where you're actually not doing anything, you're just thinking about doing something, that's the classical. So what I'll write up here is observed and classical. This is what could happen. This is what did happen. You know what, let me replace could with should. This is what should happen, not could. This is what should happen. This is what did happen. Well, that's not going to use this example, but if you flip a coin ten times, what should you get? You should get five heads, five tails. If you actually did it, are you going to get five heads, five tails? Maybe, maybe not. If you do the observation, you might get six heads and four tails. That's what did happen. So that's the difference. You can do the same. You can think about the, the probability. It should be five out of ten. You can do the probability. It might not be five out of ten. Those things could line up, but they don't have to. But the act of doing that procedure, that's observed and calculated it. The act of just thinking about it and figuring out what should what should be, that's the classical how we will understand the difference. Okay. The last thing we have to, have to talk about is called subjective probability. you say, well, that has no place in statistics. Why are we doing subjective probability if it's subjective? And you've been talking this voice like this. You sound very... <laughs> well, subjective probability is something we do every single day. You go to your doctor and you go, doctor, what are the chances I'm going to make it? And he goes, 80%. Does that mean out of every 10 people that he's worked on, two of them have died? No. It just means his best guess for your particular situation is you got a pretty good shot of making it. Don't worry about it. 80% is pretty good, right? 20%? It's only one shot out of five that you're going to... Whatever. You know, take chances. But anyway, that's subjective probability. How about this one? What are the chances right now that I'm going to walk out that door... Or, yeah, you might want this to happen, but... I might walk out that door and get hit by a meteor. No, you won't want that on me, would you? Good, because you'd probably get taken with me because we're in the same building, so. <laughs> so if I, if I walk out that door, what are the chances I'm going to get hit by a meteor? 90%? Probably not. How, how many, what, what is it? Huh? I mean, is it zero? Is there a chance? Maybe point zero 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 forever and a little one at the end maybe. But the point is that it's neither classical nor subje subjective. I'm not thinking in my head, how many possible ways could I walk outside and get hit by a meteor right now? Well, and I'm not thinking, I'm going to calculate how many ways I've walked out of this classroom and then how many times I've gotten hit by a meteor and figure out what the percentage is. Right? That's not what I'm doing. This is not an observation. I haven't walked out of this time a million, a room a million times and calculated Oh, I've got hit by meteor zero, therefore the probability is zero. There is a chance. It's a very small chance, but it's a subjective chance. I'm just kind of making it up, right? Based on, based on my past experience and based on my educated guess. It hasn't happened to me before. I know that meteors circle around, but none of them's ever even come close to me, so it's probably close to zero. But it's not based on any math. It's not classical. It's not observed. You see the difference? The doctor thinks probably the best one. He's not basing that on, on any math. He's not doing the calculations. He's just saying out there, you got like a 95% chance of being okay, or you got a 20% chance this is going to turn into cancer or something. I mean, that, that happens all the time uh, that people say that. So that's the subjective type of probability. It's someone's estimate based on an educated guess. Now, let's go ahead and do some examples here and see what we can find out about these things, whether they're classical or observed, and then we'll calculate the probabilities as we go.
Okay, so first one. The probability of selecting a heart heart like that, like that kind, not like the beating heart, I mean like the, like the heart shape from a standard deck of cards, if they're shuffled up and everything, randomly selected, so someone holds up, do you know cards? Okay, some people, they, they aren't familiar with the cards. Cards have four suits, diamonds, spades, clubs, hearts. Uh, there's 13 of each suit, okay? So there's 13 hearts, 13 clubs, 13 spades, 13 whatever I didn't say. And there's 52 total cards, right? Uh, cards are labeled two through 10. Then you have jack, queen, king, and ace, making up 13 individual numbers for each suit of cards. If you're not familiar with cards, give yourself a pack of cards because I'm gonna be using that in some of our tests to illustrate this. So, probability of selecting a heart from a standard deck of cards. So we want the probability of heart. It's fine to use symbols like that. That's okay. We don't have to call it event A in this class. We say we want the probability of finding the heart. I don't mean true love. <laughs> that is zero. Uh, oh. <laughs> cynical, cynical. Just kidding, just kidding. If you found your love, congratulations for you. No, no, no. It happens all the time. Anyway. Um, I better not have my girlfriend watch this video. <laughs> so, anyway. We're going to calculate the number of parts there are divided by the number of total cards there are. So, how many parts do you have in the deck? Hearts in the deck. Oh, okay. okay. And how many total cards? Calculate the probability. How much is that? Actually, the probability of finding true love in the real world. That's just crazy. I mean, weird. You wouldn't think. Anyway, uh, so yeah, there's a 25% chance of finding true love or a heart in a deck. Now, is this classical or observed probability? What do you think? Did you actually go pull the card out of the deck? Then it's not observed. Okay. Did you actually pull the card out of the deck? Did anyone pull the card out of the deck? Did anyone talk about pulling several cards out of the deck and calculating them? No, what you did is you said, how many is there divided by how many total cards there are? What should happen? You should have a 25% shot of pulling out a heart from that deck. That's classical probability. Are you, are you seeing that this is classical? Okay. This is what should happen. Now, let's say this, last example for today. You take a coin, you flip a coin a hundred times. You happen to get 64 tails. What I want to know is what's the probability of getting a tail? Find the probability of getting a tail. Here's how we did this with uh, with observed, we, well, or classical, either one. You found out the n number of possible things you had. So in our case, how many times did we actually flip the, the coin? How many tails did we find? Well, this shouldn't be too hard to figure out what's the probability there. What did you say here is you have a 64% chance of getting a tail. Now, is this classical or is this observed? Did anyone actually flip the coin? Yes, they did. That's absurd. Definitely absurd. 
Because look at the difference here. Here it says you flip the coin 100 times, you get 64 tails. Someone actually did that, okay? Someone did something. Here, did anyone do anything? That's theory. This is, this is observed. This is what actually happened. So what, this is the observed. It's what did happen. For subjective, use the doctor one. You have an age percent chance of, of being okay. How many people understood what we talked about today? Okay, I was just joking about true love. It does exist. It really does. <laughs> just, just making it funny, okay? So don't go home and start crying or anything. It's okay, so as we were talking about, last time we did some examples of how to do observe classical and subjective probability. Let's continue that. So if you didn't know, my favorite quarterback who unfortunately isn't playing anymore, I guess, is Peyton Manning. You know who Peyton Manning is? Yeah, he's injured. Yeah, right? His neck or something? He's out too much. See, if he was just a real man, he'd just play with a neck injury. That's smart to do, right? That's his second surgery. Well, that's yeah, his third surgery. Third his third, surgery, yeah. yeah. No, I'm just kidding. You never want to mess with a neck injury. So I've heard. I guess it's important somehow. Next couple things. Anyway, Peyton Manning, when he first started out, I'm making this statistic up, but he's pretty good, so it's probably true, uh, completed 385 out of his first 528 passes. find the probability that Peyton Manning is going to complete a pass using this information. Let's talk a little bit about the vocabulary of the statistic stuff, this probability that we were talking about. Firstly, can you tell me what the event is here? What's the event? What are we looking to have happen? Because that's our event. Not just a pass, but what about the pass? Okay, completing the pass would be the event we're looking for. What's the procedure? What's, what's happening here? Yes, that's right. That's the procedure. He's actually throwing the ball to somebody. That's a procedure. The event is we're looking to see if he's going to complete a pass. That's what we want to find out. Are you guys okay on those, those two things? The procedure is what's happening. Event is what we're looking to see and find the probability of actually occurring. So our, our event is completing the pass. Uh, by the way, what letter stands for probability that we're going to use? Yeah, that's pretty clear. So probability of, and we're just going to write the event, completing a pass. Now, a lot of people, if I ask them, or if you went out on the street and you said, um, can you tell me what's the probability of Peyton Manning completing a pass? This would be the same idea as if you went outside and asked some people who really don't understand probability, what's the probability it's going to rain today? And they say, oh, well, 50%. It's going to be 50% whether he's going to complete a pass or not because either he's going to complete it or he's not. Either it's going to rain or it's not. That type of logic, do you see how that's kind of like false logic for what we're talking about? That There's a whole bunch that goes into calculating whether it's going to rain or not today. Uh, probably it's not going to rain. I'm, I'm, not, I'm thinking it's probably not 50-50, right? Because it's going to rain like half the time all the time. That, that wouldn't make sense. We know if it's like July 20th, what's the probability it's going to rain on July 20th in the Central Valley? Pretty close to zero. Yeah, it's not complete. What's the probability Peyton Manning's going to complete a pass? Well, it's not 50-50, because he doesn't complete exactly 50% of his passes. In order to make such a judgment, you actually have to consider his past practices, what he's been doing. So that's where this information is going to come in. You can't just arbitrarily say a percentage. That would then not be uh, classical or observed probability. That would be subjective probability, based on actually not an educated guess based on you not understanding the probability. So I need to, to kind of get away from the thought of 
if it happens or it doesn't happen, that's automatically 50-50. Do you see how that's not always the case? You sure? Okay. Well, it'd be like this. What's the probability I'm going to wear a dress tomorrow? <laughs> it's not 50-50, folks. <laughs> it is zero. I mean, a hundred. I mean, zero. It is zero. It's Tuesday. You don't know what I do on Tuesdays. Okay. So what's up? I'm just joking. I don't wear dresses. Only on Halloween, once. That's what you say. Yeah. That's what I say. Yeah. Take me over. Okay. So instead of just going, well, it's 50-50. We're going to use information that I'm, I've given us, and how we did the probability is we calculated. The number of times something actually happened uh, successfully, the number of times our event occurred, that's what the more specific way to say that, the number of times our event occurred divided by the number of times the procedure was repeated. So how many times did our event occur here, which was completed in the past? What now? 385. Right. How many times did, was the procedure repeated? When you're doing the probability, give me three decimal places uh, because we like to translate that to a percentage often and we want to make sure we have like 35 point something percent. That's common. What is it now? Point. Like that? Round it correctly? Yes? Point seven two nine. What's point seven two nine then? So 72.9 percent. So this or Or that. Is that good? Yes. Now that's a judgment call, right? And when this was actually just calculating probability, saying whether that's good or not, that's a judgment call. You'd say, oh, well, well that's good, or that's not good. What if someone completes 100% of their passes all the time, then relatively he wouldn't be as good. But 73% is pretty good for completing passes. So anyway, are you guys all okay with, com with actually calculating this probability? Now, the question I have for you, which you also need to know, this is the, a problem like this is going to be directly on your test, just like that. But then there's going to be a, be a part B. And you have to answer whether this is, don't say it out loud, don't want people to think about it, whether this is classical or observed probability. So think on that for a second. Is it classical or observed or subjective? Now, here's the differences again to show you, you've got to get this in your head. Subjective means there's no data whatsoever. You just are making something up. But it's based on educated guess, like a doctor would. When a doctor says you have a 90% chance of pulling through, that would be subject subjective. Um, classical would be based on the theory, like what should happen in this procedure or this for our outcomes. Observed is something actually happened. You calculated it based on past incidents, incidences of occurrence or past procedures. So using that information, is this observed, is this classical, or is this subjective? Definitely observe. He actually threw the ball, right? He actually did something and someone just wrote down every time what happened. That is observed. There'd be no way to do this classically. Because, well, really, I mean, if you think about it, in order for you to do a classical probability, the outcome has to have the same chance of success every time, right? Every single time. And when Peyton Manning throws the football, sometimes it's like from you, and sometimes it's from here to 80 yards down the field. This guy's got a rocket, a laser rocket arm. Have you seen that commercial? No? Nobody? This is like eight years ago. I'm older than you, I guess. So anyway, he's got a laser rocket arm. So you know. Um, so anyway, he throws the ball. There's, there's less chance of that actually succeeding. You can't calculate the, the chances every single time. We can't even do this classically. This is the only way we can do it is observed. Let's look at a couple more. Let's say I give you a deck of cards. Have you guys looked through the deck of cards yet? You guys familiar with the deck of cards? Hopefully you are. So given a standard random deck of cards, Let's find the probability of randomly selecting a 2.
So we want to find, here's how you would write this out, the probability of 2. What's our event in this case? Say that louder. Selection of 2. That's the event. What's the procedure? Procedure. What are you actually doing? Picking a card. Or what are you pretending to do, I guess? You're, yeah, you're picking a card. That's the procedure. Uh, picking out one card. The event would be we're looking to see if, what's the probability of finding the two. That's the difference between a procedure and an event. Okay, so if we're going to do this, we need to have the number of choices that are going to uh, make our event successful or we're going to have over the number of choices that we have total. So what are the total number of choices we have for cards in a standard deck of cards? Now, how many ways can we accomplish our event? Four ways. Four ways. Yeah, because there's one, two in each suit, so that's four. And we calculate four out of 52. How much is four out of 52? Point zero seven. Point zero seven. How much is that as a percent? Seven. Yeah. Is that good or bad? I don't know. I don't know. That's, that's subjective, right? Yeah, I mean, for, for you, that might be a low, that's a fairly low probability of getting a two randomly of, out of 52 cards. Not like 50%. It's not certainly not 73% like Peyton Manning throwing the football. It's like a sure thing. But um, random deck of cards, you're selecting a two. Now, is this subjective probability? Are we just guessing here? So it's definitely not that. Is it observed probability or is it classical? What do you think? Why isn't it observed? We can actually go through the motion of taking the cards out and saying, oh, we got a two, put it aside, and then, oh, we'll keep going, oh, we got another two. Right, you didn't. You, you, you didn't do that at all. It's not like Peyton Manning, right? He actually threw the ball, and you calculated that. You didn't say, oh, I drew a card out and put it back um, 83 times. And out of those 83 times, 21 of them were twos, or something like that, or five of them were twos. You didn't actually do a procedure here. You just calculated the what should happen in your procedure. Do you see the difference here between the Peyton Manning example, where he actually did something, and this example? Now, could you turn a card example into an actual observed probability? The answer is sure you could, if you just took the deck of cards and did it. You know, So if I gave you this on a test and said, OK, a person drew out five cards with replacement from a deck of cards. He got one, two, um, a jack, a king, another two, and an ace. What's the probability that, they're gonna, that you are going to pull out a two from this deck of cards? You'd have, you had two twos that pulled out out of 52 cards. That would be your, I'm sorry, out of five tries. So that would be your probability is the two out of five. So it would be how much you got out of how many cards you drew. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so that's, that's the difference here. You can talk about the same question. It just depends on how this was actually accomplished, whether they did the procedure or whether they're talking about the theory of it. So this, for sure, for us, this is going to be classical. You know, a while back, someone did a poll on cloning, back when uh, stem cell research was just kind of coming out. This was a few years ago. And stem cells, people thought they were going to be using those for cloning. And so they did this, this poll on whether people thought cloning, sorry, cloning people was good or bad. So here's the results of that. <clears throat> so when they did this poll, 91 percent, I'm sorry, not 91 percent, 91 people said cloning was really good idea because they wanted this extra person, have you seen the, have you seen the movie The Island? Great movie. All, all kind of about the, the cloning idea. Um, oh, I don't want to ruin it for you. But it's about, come on, I just ruined it for you. Uh, 91 people said cloning was a really good thing. good. <laughs> 901 people said, you know what, I'm not really so sure about this cloning thing. 
Say cloning that. Cloning that. The rest of the people had no opinion. Uh, because you're always going to get some no opinions in a group. Like, you know what? I really don't care. I just want to play my video games. Leave me alone. So, 20 people. No, nah, maybe they just didn't know. They, they really don't have the information. They haven't really thought about that. They didn't have any opinion. If this was a random poll, this should give us some indication about the general public. Whether you can go outside right now and ask somebody about cloning, whether they think it's a good or a bad idea. If this was collected randomly in the methods that we've used earlier in this class. Remember talking about those, like the systematic sampling, or the stratified, or the cluster sampling, all that good stuff. So let's pretend this was done that way. Maybe it was. I really don't, I don't remember where this came from. But let's say it was. It should give us some indication about everyday people. So let's go ahead and find the probability that we can go outside right now and randomly select a person who thinks cloning is a good idea. So what we want to find, and we're going to use appropriate symbols here, we want to find a probability that someone thinks cloning's good. How in the world are we going to figure this out? How in the world? Firstly, before we talk about that, can we determine whether this is um, classical or observed or subjective? Is it subjective? Is it subjective? Now it's based on some data here. So is this going to be classical or is this going to be observed? What do you think? Yeah, It's based on some, something that actually happened, right? Some people went out there and collected data. Polls, hopefully this is, polls, poll, not, not polls, <laughs> polls, like what do you think? Polls are always observed because you're always collecting data, right? You're always talking to somebody. That's, that's observed. You're observing what they're, they're doing. Um, it's not classical, it's not based on theory, it's what actually you collected. So a poll is definitely always going to be observed. So we'll write that down. This is certainly observed probability. Hopefully the difference between observed and classical is becoming really clear to you. I hope that's happening. Now, how do we calculate observed probability? Well, it certainly is still division because that's how our probabilities are calculated. We calculate the number of people or number of things that accomplish our event divided by the number of times our procedure was repeated. So, number of times that we accomplished our event, which was cloning was good. How many is that? How much? Say it louder. Ninety-one. Very good. Cloning good. Cloning good. Ninety-one people. Ninety-one people. Out of how many people? What do we have to do to find how many people? Is it out of ninety-one? Is it out of nine hundred one? Add them up. Add up these two? Good, because even the no opinion people, they still took that poll, right? They just didn't categorize themselves. So we add all that up. What now? Like that? Sweet. That's how many people were involved in this poll, in this procedure. So we calculate 91 divided by our 1,012 and to the third decimal place, we get what? Is it point zero? Eight nine nine. Good. The nine moves that nine up to a ten, but it, okay, good. So basically, nine percent. So right now, going out there, what this suggests is that randomly picking out a person, you should have a nine percent probability of getting someone who thinks uh, cloning is a good thing. 
So maybe that's higher now, who, who really knows, but this is, a, this is a old poll. But that's how you would calculate uh, such things. Which makes you feel good about what we've talked about so far today. Good, that's fantastic. Are there any questions before we get going? I'm going to have to race this side here. You all kind of understand the whole Peyton Manning thing. That's observed because he actually did the passes. The deck of cards, we're not really drawing cards. We're just kind of thinking about what should happen here. That's our classical. We have another observed. Anytime you get a poll, man, if they're doing the research, that's definitely observed. They're, they're taking that information in. There you go. Find the, find the probability a bird will poop on your car today. If you wash your car, it always happens. They're right out there, right on the freaking guns, darn birds. I wish they had a BB gun. Every bird. Anyway. So find the probability a bird's going to poop on your car today. Um, is that going to be a classical probability we're going to find? It? Is there a way to tell how many ways this event can happen? How many ways can this bird poop on your car? I don't know. It could be flying. It could like land in the car. It could hit the windshield and go, oh crap. Get it. <laughs> okay. Is it observed? I mean, you could. You could talk about observed, right? If you had calculated how many times birds have pooped on your car over the past whatever amount of days divided by the number of days, you have a probability there. That would work. Have we done that? So it's definitely not classical, that's impossible, because you don't have an equal chance of the bird pooping on your car every single day. That doesn't happen. Um, but when it's in the garage and the bird poops on there, I mean, that, you're really unlucky. That's actually crazy. <laughs> it's happened to me before, actually. The bird was in my garage. Speaking of bird. Uh, it's on a dairy. Anyway, uh, it's, it's definitely not observed because we haven't really calculated this. So the probability of a bird pooping in your car is, what is it for you? Heather, go ahead. It is subjective, but I mean, what's your probability oh. for, for your car today? Would you say like 10%, 20%? Sure. Sure. Good, good thing I just put words in your mouth. Okay, how about <laughs> over here? What's the probability, Karina, someone's going to Not someone. <laughs> <laughs> that would be really bad. That would be really unlucky. That some, some bird's going to on your car. What would you think? See, for me, it'd be like 50%. My car always gets pooped on. That's another thing about subjective, right? It can change person to person. Um, so if you can think of the probability and you say, well, for me, that's 20%, maybe your car never gets pooped on. It's like 5%. For me, it's like 50 to 70%. It always gets some, I park under trees. So I mean, duh, it's going to happen. But subjective probabilities can do that, right? They can change. Can classical and observed change? Now, this is based on hard evidence. Um, this one was based on complete theory, which is, is not going to change, okay? So that's another way to kind of view this as well. So find the probability this, is, this stupid bird's going to take a dump in your car. Uh, it's, it depends on who you are, but this is certainly going to be subjective. And it probably depends on where you park. If you're parking by the beach and there's lots of seagulls, then yeah. Okay, let's go ahead and do one more. I'll give you a couple, uh, couple notes that are important for us, and then we'll continue to talk about some complementary events and what that even means. Let's find the probability that if a couple has three kids, two of them are going to be boys.
Now, I also have to tell you that we're going to assume that the probability of uh, a boy or a girl coming out is 50%, right? It's, it's equal. Um, that's not always the case, actually. If you actually do the observed probability, girls right now have a higher chance of, of being born. Um, so that's, I think there's like 51% women born, 50, 49% men, or something like that. It's not exactly 50-50. Uh, but we're going to consider it for this exercise to be even. Does that make sense for you? So, assuming equal chance of boy girl. So, an equal chance of boy girl. Hey, what firstly is our event? What's our event? Okay. Firstly, how many babies are we having? Are we having just one? Can we ask the question, um, if you have one baby, how many ways can you get two boys? If you have one baby, you cut them in half. You guys are sick. Weird people, my goodness. Okay, so, <laughs> firstly, what is our procedure even? What's our procedure? What's happening here? What now? You can say it if you're wrong, it doesn't matter. It should be video recorded. Everyone in the world's going to hear it. <laughs> no, seriously, what is our procedure? What are these people doing? Having babies. Making babies. <laughs> Having babies. <laughs> Making babies. That'd be a different class. Okay, Having babies. Um, so how many babies are they having? Are they having one baby? Three. Three. They're having three. That's our procedure. The procedure is having three children. Okay, the procedure is not just having babies. It's having a specific number of babies. Do you see the difference there? You can't even talk about this if you only have one baby because you can't say, out of having three children, how many ways could you have two boys if you're only having one baby? You don't fit in that category. So our procedure right here, if you want to write that down, the procedure is having three children. Now the event is based on that procedure. What's the event? The event is what you're looking for. What are you looking for? Two boys. Two, two what now? Two boys. Two boys and what else? Hopefully, hopefully you get a girl if you have three kids. I mean, you're not just going to get two boys and nothing, right? Girls count too, guys. Girls count too. Well, if you have two boys, what's the other one? A girl. A girl. We hope. Right? It's going to be a girl. So we have two boys and we have one girl. We're not going to get three boys. That would not be our event. So right here, I, I guess I will write this down for you. The procedure is having three children. Congratulations. Having three children. The event is getting two boys. If I say two boys, that means out of three children, one of them has to be a girl. So we want to find the procedure, I'm sorry, the probability, I'm sorry, of our event, two boys, one girl. Oh my. We're going to bring up some other other words that we haven't talked about in a couple days now. Before we do that, I do want to figure out whether this is going to be subjective, observed, or classical probability. Is this going to be subjective probability? We're going to be calculating stuff over here. We're not just going 30%. No, we're not doing that, right? We're not basing it on an educated guess. We're not a doctor. We're going to be doing the actual either theory or observations here. Have we observed some people? Have we observed some people? Is this what we're doing? Do I have some data on the board for you that says, here are 100 couples who had three kids. 30 of them have two boys. Have I done that? So is this observed or classical, do you think? Also, this gives it away. equal chance of being a boy girl because in order to calculate the probability if it's classical you have to have the equal chance of something happening 
you can't do classical probability if you don't have that case. Okay, if girls had a 51% chance of being born and boys only had a 49% chance of being born, you couldn't do this classically. Okay, you would have to do observe. Uh, they have to have that equal chance. Like rolling a die. Remember talking about rolling a die last time? So if it's a way to die, all bets are off. You can't do classical probability because it's not even. You don't have an even chance of getting a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. The only reason you were able to come up with it last time is I said, what's the probability of rolling a 2? You said, oh, well, it's 1 6. There's 1 2, there's 6 sides, therefore 1 6. That assumes that every side has an equal chance of coming up. If that doesn't happen, i.e., if this does not take place, not equal, you can't do this classically. Not even if you understand that. Okay, good. Now, so we have our procedure, we have our event, we know this is going to be classical probability. Write that down if you want to. This is certainly classical, this is not observed. We need to find out something called, oh, our, we need to find out what could happen. What could happen is our whole group of outcomes is called our, this is called filter. So our whole group of outcomes, everything that they could happen, all put together is called our sample space. Say that louder. Sample space. Sample space. Does that word ring a bell to you? The sample space is every possible outcome you could get. We need to list our sample space in order to do this classically. It's because you have to know what can happen. If you're rolling a die, your sample space is just easy. It's one, two, three, four, five, or six. For this case, though, we're going to have some different, different things we have. So if a couple has three kids, sample space to have those funny looking brackets, let's list out what you could get for three kids. What's the first thing you could get? Or what's one thing you could get? What should we start with, I should assume? All three boys, okay. Great. You get a boy, then a boy, then a boy. What else? Okay, three girls. Good luck with that one. What do you think would be tougher, three boys or three girls? Three girls. Three girls. I think three girls would, yeah, personally. Uh, boys are, are just nasty, gross people, but girls can be mean, man. <laughs> okay, so three boys, three girls, what else could we get? By the way, I like to start off with this way and this way and then list out everything that starts with a B, everything starts with a G, <laughs> that way you don't forget anything. So let's start with the, the triple boys, we got up that, what's, we got that up there, what's the next thing? We could do that. Someone else give me another one. Uh-huh. Okay, give me another one. Boy, girl, girl. Anything else starting with a B? Nope, that's all of them. Okay, so girls, we could do the girl, girl, boy. We could do GBG, and we could do GBB. <laughs> girl, boy. Have we missed any? Now, before you start saying, well, Mr. Leonard, I mean, aren't some of these the same? Like, isn't, wouldn't this be the same, having two girls and one boy, and then having a girl and a boy, then a girl? And no, people, I mean, we have individual personalities, right? These are different people. So if you had a girl first, and then another girl, and then a boy, you'd have a different family than if you had your girl, and then your boy, and then your girl, wouldn't you? Completely different families. So these are eight different families that could happen with your situation if you're going to have three kids. Are you with me on this? Okay, so there is a difference there. So if we have these eight different choices, what we need to find out, there's only eight different choices. Eight possible ways you can have three kids. You agree with that, right? There's only eight possible ways. All three boys and then all three girls and whatever you have permutation of those. Um, how many ways would accomplish our event? Three. Which ones? What I asked for? <laughs> two boys, one girl. Oh, this one? Yeah. one and the next one. Good. Good. Very good. Yeah, anything that has the two boys and the one girl. Because we didn't say what order, right? We just said ultimately two boys and one girl. There's three, three ways that that can happen. Notice how it's certainly not observed, right? We didn't make a family have eight sets of three children and then calculate which ones came out with two boys. That'd just be crazy. It'd be like, how many kids? Oh my gosh, I don't even want to think about that. 24 kids? 
So eight, eight ways we can accomplish our event out of eight possible outcomes. Remember, these are called, these things, each individual one are called what? What are these? No, these aren't probabilities. The probabilities are what we're calculating here. This is our sample space. The sample space is made up of every individual. What type of event? This is an event. That's our main event. Main event of the evening, boat is right here. And then we have many events called, starts with an S, rhymes with impl. Impl, rhymes with impl, not ample. <laughs> they're simple events. They're, they're an, an individual outcome. So we need to get this down, folks. You need to know what a procedure is, what's going on. An event, what you're ultimately looking for. Simple events, how your procedure can be accomplished. And the way we find our probability is take the things that accomplish our event divided by the total number of simple events. That's what we have right here. And that will give us a probability. And the sample space is everything? Sample space is this. Yeah. Everything that could happen. The sample space is made up of simple events. What is this? So 37.5%. So you know right now, if boys and girls have an equal chance of occurring, which they, they they're, it's really close, so this is going to be very accurate for us. If you were to go out there right now and have three kids, don't do that without thinking about it. Um, you're going to go out there and have three kids. You're going to have a 37.5% chance of having two boys and one girl. You'll also have a 37.5% chance, chance of getting two girls and one boy. Because there's, there's three more of those probabilities. Can you find the probability of getting all three boys? What's that? One out of one out of eight. Or all three girls, one out of eight. Thankfully, that, that's a lower chance than two boys and one girl, or two girls and one boy. Okay, a couple of notes for us before we go any further. Firstly, did this make sense for you? A couple, a couple of notes. <clears throat> Probabilities always have to be between zero and one. You can't ever have a probability less than zero, a negative chance of something happening. What's the probability of a rule of three? Negative two. <laughs> Make any sense, all right? So probabilities are between zero and one. Notice every probability we've calculated before we change it to percentage was between zero and one. Can't be over one. Can't have more than 100% chance of something happening. I know we kind of use that loosely in real life. You go, um, how much attention are you focusing? I'm focused 110%. You're like, you're just a liar. You focus 110%. Mathematically, the only way you can focus 100%. Make sense. Yeah, it's between zero and one, though. So probabilities are always between zero and one. And you can be zero. What would a probability of zero be? What, what does that imply about your event? If you have a probability of zero, that would say that your event is impossible. It's, it'd be like this. Um, roll a die for me one time. What's the probability of rolling a die and getting a rabbit? <laughs> you go, that's not, that's not going to happen. Right? I'm not a magician, but musician. I am a musician. I'm not a magician. You can't just make a rabbit appear from a, a dice. Right? It doesn't make sense. So something that cannot happen in an impossible event would have probability zero. With that in mind, what's the probability equal to one imply? Well, this is possible. That's not equal to one. That's certainly possible, right? You can get two girls and a boy, or what did I say? Two boys and a girl. You can get that. So probability of one means it's more than possible. It's certainly more than impossible. Oh, duh. Okay. Probability of one means more than just possible. What's it mean? It will happen. It's certain. 
It's certain. If I say there's a hundred percent probability that you're going to have homework tonight, oh. <laughs> well, that sucks, huh? That means that it's certain you are going to have homework tonight. Hundred percent probability p equals one means a certain event. It'd be like this: roll a die. What's the probability of getting one, two, three, four, five, or six? You are going to get one of those numbers. It's certain. Also, one other thing. This is called the law of large numbers. If you want to write down law of large numbers, go for it. This is what this means. I want you to think on this. You ever flipping the coin? Well, actually, we just kind of pretend to flip a coin. If, we, if you took your coin out and you flipped it ten times, are you for sure going to get, let's say it's a, weight, a nice, evenly weighted die, so the probability of getting heads and tails is 50-50. If you flip it ten times, are you for sure going to get five heads and five tails? It's possible you could get only three heads and seven tails, right? That's, that's quite possible. If you flip it a million times, you're probably not going to get exactly 500,000 heads and 500,000 tails. You're probably not going to get that, but as you increase the number, the observed probability is going to get very close to the classical probability. For instance, if you flip it 10 times, you might not get 5 and 5. If you flip it a million times, it's going to be pretty close to 50-50. You might get five, uh, 490,000 and 510,000, that uh, ratio. If you increase it to infinity, observed probability will actually approach, which means it's going to become classical probability. So those two things will increase. Does that make sense to you? The more you repeat a procedure, the closer observed will be to uh, classical theory. You can see this in the poll, I mean the polling that, that we did, like the, the survey. If you go out there and you start polling five people, are they going to be very representative of the population of the United States of America? Probably not. If you increase it to a thousand, is it more representative? If you increase it to 300 million, is it more representative? That's like almost everybody. We have like 307 million people here. So as you keep increasing your observed probability, your observed um, results, it's going to approach classical probability. So that's the law of large numbers. As you increase, or sorry, the more procedures repeated, the closer observed will be to classical probability. Procedures repeated, the closer observed probability will get to classical probability. Just a lot of large numbers. The more you do something, the more your observations will mimic um, the theory. Or the more that what does happen will look like what should happen. Let me go into what we talked about today. Is there any questions on, on any of this stuff? The law of large numbers, or why probabilities are between 0 and 1, or why probability zero is impossible or one is, is definite, it's going to happen. Or the difference between subjective, um, classical, or observed probabilities. Do you have any questions on those things? Do those ring a bell in your head? Does it make sense for you? Yes? Okay. So when we say complementary events, what we're talking about in this class are events which are mutually exclusive. Have you ever heard of that, that phrase, mutually exclusive? Have you ever heard of it? Never heard of it? Mutually exclusive is, is, is this idea, if I can say it correctly. Mutually exclusive. Some of these words are hard. It says if you're in one group, you're automatically discounted for being in another group. You can't be in both at the same time. You have to be either here or you have to be here. Um, unless you really, well, unless you're a strange dressing person, you're either going to wear shoes or you're going to wear sandals, right? You're not going to wear both shoes and sandals at the same time. I hope, because that would just look ridiculous. Unless you deal with those kind of Tiva-looking things, which are kind of shandles, 
shoe sandals. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, sh would it be shadows? Sh 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 sandal <laughs> shoes? Whatever. Anyway, so y you're not going to wear both shoes and sandals at the same time, right? You're either wearing shoes or you're wearing sandals. Those groups are generally mutually exclusive. And so that's what that, that term means. It means that you're either in one group or you're another. There's no crossover, basically. So when we talk about complementary events, what complementary events are, are two events which are mutually exclusive. I'll, I'll give you some better examples that relate to this class in just a second. By the way, when we say complementary, I did spell it wrong. It's not with the I. It's not like compliment. Like, you look nice today. So these events are not sitting there going, you're such a good-looking event. Oh, thank you, event. I feel like a good-looking event today, so I appreciate that compliment. It's not that type of compliment. It's, it's, this, it's the definition of they're mutually exclusive. One doesn't happen while the other one happens. So they, they cannot happen at the same time. So complementary events... These are events which are mutually, mutually exclusive. Wow, I'm having a hard time with that. Mutually. I, have, I promise it's mutually. I can't say that word, just not today. Mutually exclusive. The most basic definition I can give you for mutually exclusive is two events which can't happen at the same time. Let's talk about just a, a basic example of that. Okay, let's bring back our dice, the six-sided, just standard, standard die. Okay, um, I say, okay, I want you to roll the die. Can you get both a two and a five when you roll the die once, one time? Can you get both a two and a five? Those would be mutually exclusive events. One event would be rolling a two, the other event would be rolling a five. They obviously cannot happen at the same time when you're rolling the die one time. That would be mutually exclusive. Okay. Uh, same thing like drawing out some cards. Drawing out a heart and drawing out a diamond, if those were your events, would be mutually exclusive events. They won't happen at the same time. Remember, we're talking about one event, one procedure at a time. Not like, draw out three cards. Can you get both a heart and a diamond? Yeah, you could in that case. But for one card, those would be mutually exclusive. I you have to understand that, that concept. Okay. Okay, so what is a compliment? First, some notation. If we have some event, so let's say we have event A. The complement of event A Complement of event A is denoted it looks a whole lot like a mean. It's not, but that's how we write the complement. And here shall say this. If we're talking about the complement, the complement of something and the complement of an event is all the outcomes that occur that don't accomplish your event. I'll, I'll repeat that for you. So, if we have event A over here, and we want to talk about the complement, this is called the complement of A, uh, what this says is this is all the outcomes which don't satisfy this event. Does that make sense to you? It's pretty much everything else. That's what the complement is. So the complement of event A is, is denoted complement of A and is all the outcomes when A, when event A does not occur.
does not occur. For some reason, this helps me to remember it. I don't know why this helps me remember it, but maybe this will help you remember it. When you see this, it's kind of like a minus sign. Minus, to me, means not or bad. Not. So if this is our event A, this means not A. So everything else besides A. All the outcomes that don't make A. You with me on that? That's how I remember it. Don't know if that helps you, but hopefully that, that does. So let's do an example. Let's say that my event, let's go back to the, um, the dice rolling thing. Okay. The event is, we're going to look to see if we can roll a 5. So rolling a 5. That's our event. So if we called this event a, so if that was our a, the complement would be a with that line on top of it, or the complement of a. What is the complement of rolling a 5 on a die? What do you think? Complement of rolling a 5. What else could happen, but in way to answer this question, what else could happen when you roll a die that doesn't make a 5? What else could you get, basically? Could you get a 7? That's one die. Could you seven? What else could you get besides a 5? So anything besides the five would be the complement. You all stated one, two, three, four, six. Perfect. So the complement of rolling a five is not rolling a five, or rolling not a five. For instance, what y'all what y'all stated here, one, two, three, four, and six. That's a complement. So the complement, the complementary events here work so that they, they add together to create the whole sample space. So if you're talking about two complementary events, it's got to be either one or the other. They're mutually exclusive. But together, they make up the whole thing. Can you get anything else besides a 5 or a 1 through 6? That's why they're complementary, because together they make up the whole sample space, right? You can't get a 0, you can't get a 7 or anything else. This is everything that could possibly happen. They're just in two groups, complementary events. You have the five, you have everything else. That's the complement of rolling a five. We will understand the complement. feel okay about that so far. Good. Now let's talk about the probability of these things. So what's the probability of, let's say, when I say five, I mean rolling a five, okay? What's the probability of Rolling a five. How many outcomes are going to let us accomplish our event of rolling a five? How many outcomes let us roll a five? How many fives are on the die? So there's only one specific outcome that's going to allow us to accomplish this particular event. How many choices do we have? So our probability is going to be one out of six. You with me on this? Can you tell me, let's think about this. If you have two events which are complementary, which means you're either in one event or the other, and that takes care of everything that could possibly happen, true? What does the probability what is the probability of the complement of five or not rolling a five have to be? Without even looking at how many choices, we can probably figure this out, can't we? Because you're either gonna be here or you're gonna be here. So why don't you tell me? If this is one sixth, what does this one have to be for sure? Five. Great. How much do you think the probability of an event plus the probability of the complement of that event has to add up to all the time? What do you think? Well, it's going to add to the sum. Sure. What's that sum have to be? Do you think? One. What was that? One. 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 It's going to be one. Yeah. If you add those probabilities, shouldn't you get one? Which stands for a hundred percent of everything, right? Because you're either you're either here or here. You're not you're not anywhere else. So if you add those probabilities together of the event plus the complement, that accounts for everything that could possibly happen. So there's uh, you're a hundred percent certain that you're going to be in one of those two places. Does this make sense to you? Okay, so probability of not rolling a five, and you, you can see it. I mean, there's one, two, three. There's five choices that you could have for not rolling a five. Out of our six possible choices, we get five, six, seven. Out. And we'll write that little note. The probability of an event plus the probability of the complement of that event, it has to equal one all the time.
probability of an event plus the probability of the complement must equal 1. In more basic terminology, if you have the probability of some event plus the probability of its complement, you got 1. We're going to kind of revisit this um, towards the, la the latter part of section 4.3. This is kind of going to come back at you. But if you understand it now, then you're, you're ahead of the game. Do you understand why this takes place here? If they're mutually exclusive, you have to be either here or here. You, you can't be anywhere else. So if you add those probabilities together, that accounts for everything. You have a 100% probability that you're going to be in that, that range. Do you guys feel good about the section 4.2 that we've talked about so far? Feel all right with that? Good. You having fun yet? Just lie and say, yes, this is awesome. So glad I'm here on Wednesday. Aren't you? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Good. Glad. Well, that takes care of our 4.2. We're going to go ahead and start 4.3 now.